Today we're going to go over um, hardware in a healthcare environment. So that's going to include uh, hanging a door, securing a door, uh, closing a door, and then protecting the door. Um, we're going to review very common components um, of hanging and securing an opening. Um, so that way we can get over, go over, uh, you know, how a healthcare a healthcare room can um, successfully operate. Sorry, I'm a little frazzled. This uh, the start got me going. So today our learning objectives are going to be discovering um, the diverse door hardware features made for the specific needs um, of healthcare facilities. We're going to understand how the building codes affect your, your choice of hardware and healthcare projects. Um, we're going to identify appropriate hardware components required to complete an opening. And then we're going to review special considerations for uh, a plethora of unique door opening applications in the healthcare environment. So I just read those things off, but basically we're going to take a look at um, different types of openings in healthcare. Um, we're going to go over assisted living, we're going to go over hospitals, we're going to go over um, behavioral health, and we're going to try to understand um, why we specify certain types of hardware um, to go along with each opening. So whenever we're talking hinges, whether, whether they have hospital tips, non-removable pin, um, and things like that, what they're used for, why they're there, and um, how it can help you in your hospital or your facility um, to, to better understand um, that opening. So the types of facilities, just like I just talked about, um, we have hospitals, assisted living, clinics, long-term health, uh, physical rehab, substance abuse facilities, and then laboratories. Um, all of these are going to work in the healthcare environment, uh, and each of them are going to have some very common uh, hardware that go in each of those facilities, but some of them are going to have uh, some very unique hardware that goes in those facilities. Um, so today, we're going to discuss each one of them, and I'm going to go over briefly uh, some of those hardware uh, pieces, the unique ones, some of the common ones, um, so that way we can understand them. So in all those areas, there are areas that need special attention, uh, operating rooms, x-ray uh, suites, maternity wards, patient toilets, behavioral health wards, seclusion rooms, uh, dementia wards, cross corridor double egress doors, stairwell openings, main entry, emergency room entry, and, and intensive care units. So if we look at an operating room, uh, those doors are gonna be a little bit different um, than any other uh, opening in a healthcare facility. They're gonna be, usually be a pair or they're gonna be a, a wider door. Uh, they're probably gonna be automatic. And um, if they are a pair of, of doors, or they might be fire rated, most likely will be fire rated. And um, the inactive leaf of that pair will be different than the active leaf in most cases. In some cases, they will be equal, um, but in some cases, they'll be unequal. And the unequal uh, side of the opening will most likely be automatic. And so we'll go over some of those, um, some of those openings and we'll really see what they look like, how they operate, why they operate the way they do, and um, again, get a better understanding of them. So with all that being said, in order to appropriately um, specify and supply hardware in a healthcare facility, you have to know your local building codes. This example here shows the Upper Northeast, um, New Jersey and New York, but follow your local building code to help understand what you're doing in your facility, uh, why you're doing it, and um, make sure that you meet uh, local standards and building codes so that way you can supply and specify the correct hardware in those openings. DHI, or the Door and Hardware Institute, um, created a standard that <clears throat> most specifications follow to this day. Um, the format of material in a specification or and also a schedule will be the same format across the board, whether you're looking at plans, uh, specifications, 
Um, they're all going to follow the same procedure, and that is hanging a door, securing a door, controlling the door, protecting the door, and lastly, sealing the door. So hanging the door is very simple. Um, whenever you go to uh, install a door and an opening, you need a, a hinge to do so. Uh, that hinge is going to allow you to uh, pivot that door into that opening, and it doesn't have to be a continuous hinge. It could be uh, butt hinges. It can be continuous hinges. It could also be pivots, um, but some type of hanging device will need to be used in order to um, allow that that door to swing in the opening. Once you've hanged the door, uh, you then need to secure the door. Um, you do that by way of an exit device, a lock set, um, flush bolts maybe, um, and then you have to control the door. If the opening um, is fire rated, or even if you want the door to close at all times, you have to use a door closer. Once you do that, um, the door closer does not have to be um, a standard door closer. It could also be an auto operator. Um, I doubt you're ever going to use spring hinges, but though that's another way to control an opening. But then after that, you protect the door. Um, you protect the door by using um, kick plates, push and pull plates, um, edge guards, things like that. And lastly, sealing the door, you would use um, gasketing around the opening. So if the opening is either sound rated or uh, fire rated, you would need to seal that opening up um, to where it can properly operate. So this is a chart of handing the door. So prior to hanging that opening, give me one sec. So prior to hanging the opening, you need to understand um, the hand of that of that door. Um, a lot of people go through and they talk about a lot of different ways to uh, hand an opening. I'll give you something that's very simple. Um, you either can use it, don't use it, um, it's up to you. But what I do whenever I hand an opening is I take a look at the outside of a room, which is the secure side or the side that takes a cylinder, and I take a look at what side the hinges are on. So if the hinges are on the right-hand side and it swings away from me, I call that a right-hand door. If the um, hinges are on the right-hand side again, but it opens to me, I call that a right-hand reverse. Some people have a method of putting your back to a frame where the hinges are and swinging the door to the right or swinging the door to the left, and that's how they determine their handy. I don't use that method um, because I want to know what side the, the secure side is, um, but use your own method, and as long as you are um, following um, you know, what we do commercially, you should be fine. So we can see the little chart here. Um, the one that's right beside me is a double egress opening. Um, a double egress opening is a little bit special. We're gonna talk about that later, um, but they are usually uh, left-hand reverse by left-hand reverse. And as you can see in this chart here, um, it's left-hand reverse by left-hand reverse. Um, the top left shows a um, right-hand door um, right next to it, it's a left-hand door, so on and so forth. Um, if you have any questions about that, if you need uh, me to talk you through that um, with some other type of openings, um, send me an email or um, let's chat after the um, presentation. We can go through it really easily. So what I just spoke about earlier, uh, this is part of the fundamentals, but just like I spoke about earlier with Handing the door, keying and securing the opening um, by way of keying um, goes hand in hand with that. So there are different types of keying. Um, this chart really, or this uh, this slide really is um, part of the fundamental pieces, uh, basic hardware, um, which is a class that I really um, highly suggest that we all take together. Um, and I can. 
I'll offer that later on. But anyways, key and information um, for a new key system includes construction keying, patented and restricted master keying, factory keying, key control boxes, and key control software. All of these items are part of um, actually new and could be part of existing uh, keying, just depending on what you're building or, um, or your facility is, is, is in need of. But keying um, determines the secure side of an opening. The secure side of an, op of an opening uh, determines the hand of an opening in my world. So keying is a, a very important part of any facility, um, anything that we have going on. But in the healthcare environment, keying is uh, extremely important. Even if we have access control devices that are, um, you know, providing access via fob or by motion, you're still going to need um, keying in the event of power loss or power, power failure. So uh, get to know keying. And if you have any questions on keying, let me know. So keying information in an existing system. Um, earlier, we determined, you know, setting up a new system with um, key control software, um, providing different key times and things like that in an existing system. If you aren't switching out to a new system, uh, you would need to know the manufacturer of the original system. Most of the time, you're going to provide the same manufacturer for your new uh, building or your new suite. Uh, that you were in the old suite, but if you change to a different manufacturer, you would need to know um, who that manufacturer was, what key system they used, um, what type of um, key and they used, whether it be standard, um, which is conventional core, if they use large format interchangeable core, or as you can see in this photo right here, um, small format inter interchangeable core. You would need to know the keyway um, of that core you would need to know um, if it was keyed by the factory, if it was keyed by the owner, or if it was keyed by a local locksmith. Um, construction keying is always a good idea. Absolutely, it's a good idea. Um, providing construction keying, whether it be in a new system or an existing system, allows construction to proceed, allows you to um, issue keys for that facility. And once new keys come in, you're able to lock out um, contractors and things like that um, to where you you secure your facility even more. So after um, hanging the door and keying comes finishes. Um, you're going to need to know finishes for your hinges. You're going to need to know finishes for um, your lock sets and your exit devices, your closers and your protective uh, material. Um, most commonly used in a healthcare environment is a type of um, stainless steel or satin chrome. Um, but in areas where you kind of want to ease down uh, the look of uh, or provide a, a more soothing look, you'll see that you have um, other finishes that are out there as well, such as um, satin bronze, bright bronze, uh, bright brass, um, Old rub bronze, uh, living finishes, however, um, they change over time. So if you have an oil rub bronze finish, which I hardly ever see in healthcare facilities, but if you have an oil rub bronze finish, um, keep in mind that that finish is living. As you use that um, material and things like that, as you rub on it, um, the finish is going to wear down. The finish is going to go away. And it's also... Um, will lead to the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is types of antimicrobial. Um, living finishes um, are a little bit different. Antique, antique bronze or oil rub bronze, um, I, I wouldn't suggest in a healthcare facility. Let's just put it that way. But antimicrobial finishes, I, I know that the slides are going to are going to show one thing, but uh, we're going to talk about a, a couple different things here, uh, and some of it is not on the slides, but it's um, something that's changing in, in the healthcare industry, and I wanted to go over it. Um, so, what is antimicrobial? Um, antimicrobial is a silver ion finish, uh, but I'll read the slide and then I'll explain. It, it is a powder coated silver based hardware finish that inhibits the growth of all kinds of destructive microbes like 
fungi, mold, mildew, and bacteria. So people have been using silver um, for generations, for hundreds of years to protect themselves from either poisons or bacteria um, to aid in sickness, um, to cure sickness. And so that being said, um, we now have that, or we've had, we have had that for, for a number of years, um, the ability to uh, powder coat and apply that finish to either um, stainless steel, which is the most common, or um, US 26D, which is brushed chrome. And what they do is they put a silver ion finish that is powder coated so it sticks to the uh, material. Um, as, it's, as it's applied, as it's cleaned, um, and things like that, it provides a, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, it, it provides the ability to fight off uh, bacteria. It um, repels it, um, but it doesn't uh, kill it. So it, it is a repellent. It, it um, repels bacteria from um, hardware but it it's a um, trying to think of how, how to say this it's a it's a great solution um, for different types of, of areas so areas that are high use break rooms um, patient rooms uh, operating rooms uh, intensive care intensive care units and things like that they're perfect for antimicrobial finishes they are used all the time um, so that being said, there's also other types of um, finishes that are out there that that uh, you should be aware of, and that is um, antibacterial cyanide uh, copper. Uh, a lot of manufacturers are starting to use that now, and what it is is the ability of copper ions instead of silver to actually kill uh, bacteria. So. We're going to talk about silver ion here, but there are others out there. If you need more information on that, please let me know and um, I can definitely get with you on that. So how does it work? Silver ions are slowly released um, from antimicrobial compounds to the surface of a treated hardware where silver ions attack the microbe cell wall, interrupt its metabolism and prevents its um, reproduction. Um, it, so as you can see in this chart here, it shows a um, silver ion and it shows how it attaches to bacteria. That bacteria then um, is disrupted, it's changed, and it changes its metabolism, which eventually it does die. So silver ion, I believe it starts working the moment that it, it is applied, but it does take time for it to fully repel or kill uh, bacteria. I think it takes up to 36 hours, 36 to 72 hours, something along those lines. So, as we were talking about earlier, um, the history of silver as an antimicrobial, I'm not going to talk about each one of these steps. Um, it's just important to know that throughout time, it was discovered that silver did have an effect on bacteria. It helped um, combat poison, it helped um, combat sickness and things like that. So uh, people used it. People used it uh, for many years. I mean, people even used it in medicine um, and things like that. So as you can see, early 900s, China, China used uh, silver when eating to prevent poisoning. Um, jumped to the 1880s where Creed's prophylaxis was used for infant eye drops. Um, and then in the 2000s with um, silver ion used in dwelling medical devices um, such as catheters. So there are manufacturers out there that have silver ion, they call it um, either Asian silver ion, antimicrobial. It uh, just depends on what you check. Make sure that you check um, with all your manufacturers to see what is available for those manufacturers. Some manufacturers offer um, silver ion products, and they also offer uh, antimicrobial um, or antibacterial saddle copper. Um, it just depends on the manufacturer that you're using. Um, 
Some work the same, some work better. It just depends on what you're looking for, what you're trying to do in that facility. So if you need more information, let me know. So this, um, this slide is a little uh, jumbled together. I guess that's from the way that um, my resolution is coming through. But basically, I'll read this off and um, we can talk about the type of hardware that could benefit from uh, antimicrobial uh, finishes. The most important one is the ones that touch your hands, and that's going to be lock sets, um, exit devices, push plates, um, deadlocks, hinges, um, any type of touch bar, whether it be a push bar, a push pad, um, a monitoring device, um, end caps, um, flush bolts, anything that your hands are going to touch, uh, you're going to want to use some sort of antimicrobial, um, some sort of hardware that um, allows your building to defend itself from um, bacteria. As you know, in healthcare environments, you have a very high chance of um, contracting a, a, a virus while you're at the hospital. Um, so it's very important not only to have hardware that is antimicrobial, but also um, please wash your hands, um, especially whenever you're visiting loved ones and things like that. So as we talk about just the fundamentals of all the material that um, go into healthcare facilities, now let's start talking about specific areas um, where we're going to have uh, different type of different types of hardware um, for for specialized um, areas. So the first one we're going to talk about is the most common. It's going to be patient rooms. Um, so just like we discussed earlier in the um, presentation, we're going to want to hang the door, secure the door, control the door, and then protect the door. Um, so hanging the door, uh, most commonly, you're going to be using butt hinges. Um, you're also going to use continuous hinges, and you could also use swing clear hinges. Um, I'll show you some examples of those. Again, I'm not trying to be brand, spe brand specific or anything like that, but I want to show you um, different types of material because I think it will help you understand what we're, what we're trying to get at here. This is a continuous hinge. I didn't bring a butt hinge. Um, most people know what a butt hinge looks like, um, so I didn't, I didn't um, bring that, but this is a continuous hinge. And this continuous hinge is stainless steel. It has a hospital tip. So the hospital tip is used not only to um, protect against anti-lig, but, and we'll talk about anti-lig here shortly, but also um, a hospital tip is used um, for cleaning. So if you have a smooth edge such as this, it allows a person whenever they're cleaning, um, whenever they're cleaning, beside that door, if they're cleaning uh, in between the door, it allows them to clean this area without any spaces for um, bacteria to collect. Now, you also have things such as swing clear hinges. After hanging the door, um, you need to talk about securing the opening. Um, you secure the opening with either uh, a different type of lock set, and the lock set doesn't have to be locked. It could be, um, non-lockable such as a passage or a privacy function the idea is just to allow the door to either um, to, to close and latch um, there are also different types of hospital latches out there that um, that can be used in order to facilitate or accommodate rather uh, an opening uh, hospital latches are used to to allow someone to use their hip um, or use, you know, a gurney, something along those lines to open that, open that room up. So after you do that, then uh, you want to talk about controlling the opening. 
you control the opening with a door closer, a door closer, um, which I'm going to. I wish I could show you one. I have one uh, right here that I was like, show, man. show it to us. Yeah. OK, cool. Hold on one second. Let me show you a closer. So again, we can't be brand specific, but I'll, I'll cover it up. But I wanted to show you basically what a closer looks like. Um, this is from Dorma Kava, who's who um, whose slides I'm using. This is a door closer. This is used. This is a regular arm mount um, and this is used. This one in particular is used on the pull side of an opening, but they can also be mounted to where they're on the push side of an opening um, and a door closer basically does just that function. It controls an opening to where the door um, that's open in a 90, 110, or 180 position is allowed to um, close. So whenever you have a fire rated opening, you have to have an opening that um, is self-closing and then self-latching. So you use a door closer or an automatic operator to open that door, or if it's an automatic operator, to open that door and then allow it to close back. So sorry for that technical difficulty, geez. So what you're seeing here is an image of um, a swing clear hinge. A swing clear hinge, like we talked about earlier, allows the, op uh, allows the door to swing clear of the frame. So what it does is the door itself, when it's open in a 90, 90 degree position, the door um, has about an inch and a half or three quarters of an inch, something, somewhere along those lines of blockage that you cannot you know, push through or go through. Roger, we'll talk about that here in just a second. So, the swing clear hinge allows it to open past the um, past that 90 degrees, past the frame. So that way you can get um, gurneys in. You can get um, you can get through that opening. If you want to bypass that, you can also use a pair of doors. You can use an unequal pair, or you can use a door that is three foot six, four foot. Um, whenever you're at three three foot zero, that's your bare minimum. So you have to allow 32 inches of um, of clear width to an opening. So we talked about this earlier. Um, the standard hinge is going to have a butt tip um, just like this. A butt tip. Um, is very common. This is used in most everything that we do, but a butt tip has this little space right here, this little bitty ridge that allows bacteria to, to go into and things like that. And once that happens, um, you can't clean it, um, and it, 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 it's a hazard. Also, whenever you have a butt tip, you can put string, rope, um, different things on this to where um, it creates a choking hazard and things like that. So if you're in behavioral health, something like that, um, this will pose a hazard to get around that. We talked about this earlier. We showed this. You use a butt hinge that is um, hospital tip or a continuous hinge that's hospital tip. So part of securing the door, and I'll show an example of this is um, using a hospital latch. This is a push pull latch. And as you can see, um, you can use your hip, you can use your elbow, you can use your arm, um, you can use your shoulder, you can use anything to open this door. They are made in models to where they push down on both sides, or you can pull down. Um, if it's a pull down model, then you can put in your arm to where you can open that opening as well. Um, what you see here is different functions for those openings. Um, so levers up, 
you can either have those as push, you can have them as pull, you can have one as push, one as pull. Um, it just depends on what function you're trying to achieve in your facility. So um, some other devices uh, when talking about closing um, the opening is hold open closers. So you can either have single point, which um, the door is held open at one uh, predetermined angle. Um, you can have multi-point. Um, and these, these two options are either going to be with a fire check door closer um, or um, automatic operator or maybe even a friction hold open. You keep in mind if you're using a friction hold open or a standard um, um, standard hold open, a hold open um, overhead stop, something along those lines, you got to make sure that it, that it meets um, fire safety and um, and codes like that. So uh, if you're in a fire rated opening, you're going to want to use an automatic operator. You're going to want to use a um, fire check um, style um, hold open, something along those those lines. Um, hold opens that are electromagnetically controlled. So in the event of a fire, those doors will close. Um, what these are going to be used for is if you have a um, a patient room that you want to monitor. So if you want to be able to monitor someone who is um, is very sick, or if you want to be able to monitor someone who is in the maternity ward, if you want to be able to monitor someone that's in a behavioral health situation, um, you know maybe they're uh, they're in. Uh, memory care, something along those lines, and you want to be able to monitor them and have staff monitoring those guys uh, 24 hours a day or in a select time period, this is where you're going to want to use um, uh, some type of hold open device. Um, keep in mind, um, you will have to have somebody monitoring, especially if you're in a memory care or something or a behavioral health. So some different types of stops that you would use. Um, there are wall stops. There are overhead stops. Um, there are even friction hold open stops, which the friction hold open stop. Let's see if I can show you better than just um, letting you look at the photo. So the friction hold open stop is the one that's right there. Uh, that friction hold open stop is not electromagnetically controlled. And so that is just off of friction. And what that is going to mean is um, you're going to have to go up to that door and friction is the only thing that's holding that door open. So you're going to have to go up to it and close the door. Um, wall stops, floor stops and things like that. All of those devices are going to be um, gathering bacteria, gathering dirt, gathering um, grime and things like that. So keep that in mind when specifying those um, different types of, of stops. Floor stops, um, you're usually not going to see those too many times in, in healthcare, but there are certain manufacturers that um, have some really cool uh, floor stops out there that also um, help with bacteria and um, growth and things like that. So um, if you want more information on that, please let me know. Kick plates, mop plates, door armor, armor guards. So, um, armor guards and things like that, those are applied to the edges of the doors. Uh, kick plates, um, armor guards, um, those are going to be applied to the face of the door. Those are most likely going to be in stainless steel. They are offered in antimicrobial um, stainless steel or uh, satin nickel. Um, and they're also offered in um, bacterial saddle um, copper soap. Check with the manufacturer that you're working with in order to um, get um, proper um, plates, kick plates, push plates, things like that. Um, if they are fire rated, um, you're going to want to definitely check how those um, those uh, kick plates are applied, whether they're applied by screw, if they're in behavioral health, whether they need to be applied with torques, if they're applied at lead line doors, if they need to be applied with double sided tape. Um, check with local jurisdiction, things like that, um, to make sure you're applying those properly. And um, so that's going to really matter whenever you're specifying those those um, 
those plates. Um, edge guards are um, going to be used to protect the edge of the door. As doors are held open in corridors, things like that, gurneys and people and um, magnetic holders, things like that, all those things are going to be putting different types of force on a door, especially a lead line door, a fire rated door, um, a door that doesn't have adequate blocking. Um, all of those different pressures are going to help with damaging those doors. And over time, they're going to fail. They're going to either warp, bend, bow, or even bust. Um, so edge guards are extremely important. Um, so moving from there, um, our regular inpatient room doors, um, we move into isolation rooms. You follow the same uh, standards where you're hanging the door with the same hinges that we mentioned before, securing the door. Um, they will be a little bit different um, material. Controlling the door is going to be the exact same. Protecting the door and sealing the door. So we're going to go through some of those items now. Oops. So in patient rooms, um, in isolation areas, you're going to see it's a little bit different. Um, the hardware is going to be conal. Um, so what what is conal? Um, what does that mean? I showed you the example earlier, but we'll look at it again. You see how this is sloped here? Um, it's sloped um, to be able to create a um, barrier free uh, position. So this is anti leg certified. And what this will do is as a person tries to put any type of rope or anything like that on this um, on this hardware, it will just fall off. If it was a standard square piece of hardware, um, it would then create a point, a hanging point and things like that to where someone could um, hurt themselves. Another example of one would be uh, right here where you have the exact same, uh, where it's all smooth on one edge. And let me see if, yeah, you can see it there better, where it's smooth all the way down. It allows someone uh, the ability to Put that in a patient room, um, especially in behavioral health, where you don't have to worry about hanging points and things. Here, we're going to talk about rescue hardware. Um, rescue hardware, what does it look like? How is it used? And things like that. We're going to talk about pivots. Um, and then we're going to talk about some different types of seals. So rescue hardware, and I, I know that I have a sample of some rescue hardware, but basically take a look at that right up there. Uh, rescue hardware, what is rescue hardware? Most people would um, associate rescue hardware with just being a standard uh, strike that just looks a little bit different. The one that you see in this photo here is a double lift, um, a double lift strike, it's rescue hardware, and what it does it allows a patient room going into a bathroom or going into behavioral health um, or going into um, patient rooms, um, depending on the situation where you want this. It allows a um, someone that's on the outside to open the door the opposite way. So if we we're, if we're in a restroom and um, we're just in a, a standard patient room, someone goes into the bathroom and say, they fall over um, onto the door. You cannot open the door into them to get to those people. So what you have to do is you use a rescue hardware, you use a rescue strike, excuse me, and you can open the door by um, moving the half moon um, plunger. You swivel it over. Um, that stop is now removed. The doors are able to open the opposite way. So. That being said, you have to use hardware that's going to allow for a door to be double acting. Um, you, you need either pivots to allow a door to be double acting or you need uh, double acting hinges. <clears throat> One example of those would be this right here. So this right here, it's a, it's a continuous hinge, but it's a double acting continuous hinge. And what it does, is it installs just like this on a door. Um, the do the um, frame around the door is, is cased. Um, what cased opening is, it's basically an opening or a hollow metal frame that has no stop. 
So it is flush all the way around on three sides. You install a double acting hinge. Whenever you have someone that is in distress, you're able to open the door um, from both sides. So you'll be able to open it opposite of the patient to allow you to um, service those um, to service those people without harming them or pushing them out of the way, which further um, causes damage. <clears throat> and um, you can see the um, an example of that plunger right there with that uh, rescue strike. Drug and document storage. So. Again, we're going to talk about hanging, securing, controlling, protecting, and sealing the door. Um, there's going to be just some small variances that will change that opening. Um, so let's dig into those. Maybe I should go back. At drug and um, document storage rooms, you're going to have um, either electromechanical lock sets um, or you're going to have um, standard mechanical lock sets, um, push button mechanical lock sets, um, things like that, or you're going to have some sort of access control. So um, you see an example here where you have a, um, an access control device. And what happens is going into drug and document storage areas or um, drug areas, Someone is going to have to use a key fob um, to get into that room. Um, using that key fob is going to tell the system who is able to access that door, when they accessed it, who, what their name is, and things like that. It's going to create a thing called an audit trail. Um, if you have a mechanical push button lock set, which is very common, um, only a select few people have you know, the code to that opening, um, so you can narrow down who's using um, that area, but you really can't tell who has had access unless you um, investigate all of those persons. I'm not saying that it's bad to use a mechanical push button lock set. It's just something that's different. Um, by, by creating an audit trail, um, by creating an audit trail, um, you can narrow that down really fast if if you have a situation where drugs are missing and things like that um, if you don't want to use a uh, either a mechanical push button lock set or access control um, it's not listed on here but you could also use a um, storeroom lock set which is shown here on the um, right there um, you can use a storeroom lock set and you can use an electrified strike. Um, an electrified strike is gonna cause you to use some different hardware. Um, some hardware that you might see if you used an electrified strike would be something like this, which would be a continuous hinge um, or a butt hinge with a, um, with a little pigtail, um, with a little pigtail on it. And I don't know what I'm, what I'm even talking about because an electrified strike, it's, it's totally on the other side, but basically, if you have a, an electrified strike running down the frame, you're going to see a pigtail. If you have an electrified lock set, like the one listed above, you'll see the same continuous hinge with that same pigtail that runs through the door. So my apologies for going backwards on that. But if you have an electrified strike, you can do the exact same thing where you have an audit trail um, of people going in and out of that room. Operating rooms. Now, operating rooms start to get um, really tricky with the hardware. Um, operating rooms um, and certain patient rooms, there's a lot of different things that you have to put into those rooms um, to make them operate and operate successfully. Um, right above me, you see a manual flush bolt. I'll get out of the way so you can see that manual flush bolt, but you have a manual flush bolt. Um, as you can see above above that flush bolt, that's a prote protection of, uh, a protection device um, for a um, surface vertical rod. Same type of hinges where they're going to be angled. It's a hospital tip, um, but at at operating rooms, um, these rooms are going to have um, the push you know the uh, 
hospital latches where they're push and push. And what that does is whenever you're sliding your patient room or your, your gurney through um, those rooms, you can push right through, you can hit that lock, you can go through, or from the opposite side, if you're pulling someone with a wheelchair, you can use your hip to go through that opening. Um, you'll also see um, different types of mechanical locks. We'll go through some of those. I think that the next slide has some of that material. Here's an example of, um, of an operating room. As you can see, they have um, armor plates that go across the openings. This is a pair of doors. Um, you have, it looks like a, a four foot by two foot um, pair of doors at this, um, at this room. And what makes it really unique is you can operate this door manually with, by using the, um, the hospital latches, or you can use this electromechanically with the auto operator. You would push on that, um, you would push on the um, paddle right there above me, and that would tell the, the, the door to open up. Um, I think that it's, I would have to definitely look more into this um, opening because I've never seen a situation where you have a mechanical push and pull latch um, at a at a patient room door. So this might be an easy assist, something along those lines. So they're going to push the um, they're going to push the paddle, then go over there and pull on that latch to where it opens up. Um, it's not going to open up automatically for you. So at that inactive leaf, you have um, either flush um, um, manual flush bolts, or you could have automatic flush bolts, depending on the rating of that opening, um, would define that. And looking at that opening, it looks like they have automatic flush bolts. You can see the strike at the very top. Um, what happens there is the active leaf has to close last. So you're going to have the inactive leaf closing that opening, and um, and you could see that where that strike is, that's going to um, rub on that automatic flush bolt, projecting that into the uh, frame. Shielded doors. Shielded doors are lead line doors. They're going to hang a little bit differently. It's going to be very unlikely that you're going to use a um, butt hinge to hang a lead line door unless it's a very small lead line door. Um, I would suggest using um, either continuous hinges or a pivot to um, install a lead line opening, as I think a lead line opening um, has extreme weight um, associated with it. it. Even if you're using a 16th of an inch lead, that 16th of an inch is going to be either um, on one side or it's going to be a 16th on both sides which means it's going to have an eighth of an inch lead going through that door. So if you have a three foot by seven foot door, I think the pounds of um, the poundage of, of lead is somewhere like um, five pounds um, per square foot, which means if you're looking at um, a, a 3070, you're looking at um, like 100 pounds or something along those lines of added weight. I could be wrong on that. I think there's a chart right here. So I was pretty close. If you have a 64th of an inch lead, you're adding one pound per square foot. A six, yeah, a sixteenth is three and three quarters per a pound per square foot. Eighth of an inch is um, seven and a half pounds. A quarter of an inch lead, 13 and three quarter inch pounds per square foot. I mean, just massive amount of weight. So whenever you're specifying your hardware in your opening, make sure that you recognize that if it's a lead line opening, you have to allow for either a continuous hinge or pivot hinge, which means that your, your door size and things like that is all going to change depending on what you specify. Um, take a look at the example that's shown right above me where you have a um, looks like a 16th of an inch lead on each style that uh, forms an eighth of an inch shield. 
um, through the door. As you put hardware on that opening, you're also going to change the way that the um, the lead is reacting. So if you have a closer on it that has screws that go through it, you have to account accommodate for that. Your closer is going to have to be lead shielded, the, the cover. Um, your lock set, if you have a mortise lock um, that goes through the door, that mortise lock, the um, the trim um, or even the mortise lock body, those are going to be lead shielded. If you have a cylindrical lock, your rose is going to be lead shielded. Um, so keep all that stuff in mind when specifying your hardware. Um, this is just a, a little graph of what it looks like. Um, you know, with a lead line opening. So as you can see with the, um, the frame that's depicted in the, the photo here, that's right above me. You have lead, a lead shield, lead shielding that goes right behind the uh, sheetrock, but that, but the frame itself is going to have to have um, lead in it as well at the face of it. So what you want to do is create a situation where you are providing continuous lead shielding across the opening, because as it, as you, um, I, ho I hope know that in an X-ray room somewhere where you're going to be using X-ray, um, X-rays follow a straight line. And so you want to be able to create a continuous shield um, to block the, those, those x-rays, keep those in, and things like that. Perimeter management. Um, perimeters you usually think of as exterior openings, but they don't really um, constitute that anymore. Perimeter management doors really mean the per perimeter of a suite. So managing the um, perimeter of a suite uh, and, uh, and either allowing or denying access to different facilities such as maternity wards, um, psychiatric wards, behavioral health suites, things like that. So this is an example of a double egress pair. We talked about this earlier, but we didn't really go in depth of, of uh, what a double egress pair is. Double egress pair um, will allow access from each side, and they're usually left-hand reverse by left-hand reverse because it follows the flow of traffic. Uh, left-hand reverse, as you know, is right-hand um, as you're going on the push side. So as you're going through, right-hand, and on the opposite side, it's also right-hand. Um, a double egress pair is different um, at the head of the frame. The frame is built differently. The, the um, head of the frame is built differently. The stop everything about that frame is different than a standard pair. So keep that in mind when specifying um, your material. So what they want to talk about here as far as perimeter access control, it a double egress pair, even though you can allow access from either side, you can still limit that access by use of magnetic locks and um, delayed egress devices, things like that. Um, so what those are used for is wander management. Um, wander management. So like if you have someone in a maternity, uh, maternity ward and you want to be able to, to limit access, limit the ability of a patient um, or even a non-patient going through the facility. You would have wander management software. So if 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 you've had a baby recently or even in the past five years, they give you a little wristband and that wristband um, is connected um, at the hospital, right? So you are connected to your baby and if you were not the person that um, is supposed to hold that baby or have that baby and you're trying to walk out the hospital, it will limit your access um, going through those openings. So that way it can securely um, hold you in without harming or doing harm or to yourself or to others, um, and especially that baby. Uh, this is a hardware schedule. You're going to you're going to see. Um, with this hardware schedule that it follows the same DHI format that we talked about earlier, uh, which is hanging the door, securing the door, closing the door, and then protecting the door. Um, so you'll have hinges at the top, um, followed by the type of lock set um, that helps secure the opening. 
um, what you're using to control that opening, and then lastly, how to protect that opening um, when specifying the material. I won't, I'm not going to stay on this one too long, but it's just something that's quick and easy to see. So, wander management um, and patient monitoring software and hardware. Um, as, as I was talking about earlier, mobility monitors, uh, magnets, um, de delayed egress devices, uh, key switches, and also um, access control devices on exit devices and things like that. So where you're going to um, see that maternity wards, behavioral um, health, um, places along those lines. So wander management, as you can see in this um, in this little sketch here, this is from the software and they decided which openings they were going to monitor. So if you were locked up with a device or if, let's say you were um, let's say you were in memory care, you would have the same type of um, bracelet on and you have free access throughout the facility, um, but there are going to be certain openings that they are going to limit access to. And um, it's up to us as specifiers and hardware professionals to be able to, to decide where we're going to limit that access. And so once we have that software connected to us, we can really limit um, where our patients, whether they be in a maternity ward or uh, memory care, we can kind of um, decide where they can and cannot go. They can go and eat breakfast with Jean, or they can go and play songs and things like that with uh, Mary, but they can't go outside um, to run away or smoke a cigarette or something. So cross corridor doors, it's going to be the exact same thing. And this is a, this is a repeat over and over and over again, because um, as we go through, we are still hanging the door, securing the door, closing the door and protecting the door. Even though the hardware changes, um, you're still doing the exact same thing. Uh, cross corridor doors though, something that's different that we want to talk about because it's the same, but it's different. Um, let's look at the um, exit devices. So what you see here are concealed um, concealed exits, and those concealed exits are going to be installed in the um, opening itself. And keep in mind, when you have a concealed exit device, um, you're going to have to have extra blocking either in a hollow metal door which is going to be common or in wood doors which is also common but you're going to have, to have you're going to have to have extra blocking in wood doors especially especially if they're fire rated if you don't have that blocking you're going to come up with a very serious problem that we're going to look at here shortly with a concealed um, concealed or just like in this one a, a surface vertical rod um, if you don't have that extra blocking once those doors are open, because in cross corridors, most of the time they are open to allow free access through um, the building. In the event of fire, in the event of a fire, those doors close. Um, but those doors are held open by magnets all the time. And what that does is it creates stress and things like that. If you don't have the blocking, um, you're going to see a problem here shortly of what um, comes of that. But as you can see in this, um, you have different types of um, devices that help with these openings. So if the openings are uh, fire rated and you have a surface vertical rod, you have to have on the bottom a continuous um, or yeah, continuous face. So as you can see with um, with this device at the top right here or right above me, um, you see that they have a protection device at the uh, bottom of that um, rod and they have that there so that way when gurneys wheelchairs things like that are going through there they don't bend those rods they don't bend that head case um and that's only in surface vertical rods if it was concealed vertical rod you wouldn't have that problem um, but also um, if you can look right here these things are um these things are pretty cool uh what they do is in the event of a fire whenever they heat up there's a small plastic um a small plastic cover and there's a hole on the opposite side and there inside of it um, is a spring loaded pin in the event of a fire that spring pin will melt that plastic it'll shoot through the door thus securing that opening to prevent fire from going from 
corridor to corridor. As you can see here, you have these are different applications with um, cross corridor doors. As you can see, it's, they're usually smoke or fire rated. These doors um, must be tied to a fire alarm system, especially if, I mean, if they're fire rated, they're going to be tied to the, to the fire alarm system. But um, these doors are magnetically held open with a wall magnet. A wall magnet looks um, something like this right here. And this one, um, as you can see, sorry, you have a magnet that looks like this. And then this is going to be um, on the, this is going to be on the wall. This is going to be on the door. This ties to this. So uh, what happens is it holds that door open all the time. So make sure that it complies with NFPA 101, life safety, and also NFPA 80. There's a couple examples in here. One's a pocket door application to allow a flush wall. Um, the other one is um, is a standard where it, you know the magnet comes off of the wall and things like that. Here's some photos of what those look like, and this is a really cool photo of what that. Um, double egress pair looks like at the head, you can see that the stop is on one side of one frame and on the opposite side of the other. It's very different. Um, keep that in mind when um, installing those. But as you can see, um, the opening protrudes out two inches into the opening. So make sure you accommodate for that and make sure you have enough clear width in your corridor when specifying your doors. This is what we were talking about earlier, where you start to have some problems if you're not uh, scheduling proper blocking um, at concealed vertical rods or at magnets. If it's not proper, um, you're going to have to start to have problems such as what you see right here. Um, I mainly will see these and door, you know, doors that have magnets and fire rated openings where the mineral, mineral core is uh, 90 minutes and um, there's not adequate blocking. But I also see this in openings where you have a fire rated door um, and you specify a pivot. Um, a pivot leaves zero space for an opening. And so if there's any type of pressure on that pivot, if, if it's not installed perfectly, if the screws aren't pre-drilled, if anything is done that's not perfect, um, you're gonna have problems. So most of the time, um, I think it's it's a pretty easy um, pretty easy thing just to go to a continuous hinge, but I'm not I'm not advocating for continuous hinges. Unequal pairs we saw one earlier, but there are two different types in a healthcare facility. So one type, if you have a fire rated opening, you're going to have to have um, automatic flush bolts. If it's non rated, if it's just a a standard opening that you're moving uh, equipment through or something along those lines, you can use a manual flush bolt. Um, but with an automatic uh, flush bolt, automatic or self-latching flush bolts, you're going to have to have more hardware um, at that opening because that you have to be able to allow the inactive leaf to, um, to latch first. You need a coordinator to go along with that. Um, that coordinator will allow the, um, the active leaf to hold open until the inactive leaf closes before the active leaf closes into it. So automatic flush bolts and manual flush bolts, they both have a place. Um, but if one's fire rated, fire rated and you have an unequal pair or even an equal pair that has flush bolts, it has to be automatic because all doors that are fire rated have to be self-closing and self-latching. So here's an example of what uh, that coordinator is going to look like. So as you can see, it's a very simple device. It, it's just basically going to hold one door open, the active leaf, until the inactive leaf has a chance to, to catch up and close itself. So if you have a, um, if you're in a corridor where acclimation is a problem and you have a lot of building pressure, you can't have both of them closing at the same time because what will happen is that pressure. Um, will hold both of the doors open. So what you want to do is stagger them just a little bit, have the inactive leaf close in front of it. The inactive leaf will close with limited pressure from the um, opposite side. 
the active leaf will then have a chance to close into it. The active leaf also could, you know, be turned up a little bit more. If it's an automatic operator, it can use, uh, you know, it's 50% more force to close that door. Um, so keep all that stuff in mind when trying to um, operate your opening. In stairwells, um, the, again, most of the material is the same, but you do have some things that are a little bit different. Um, in stairwells, in healthcare facilities, especially in memory care, behavioral, and also maternity, you're going to see delayed egress devices. You're going to see um, uh, limited egress devices. You're going to see key fob only devices. Um, you're going to see um, a lot of things that are going to limit access um, to stairwells um, unless it's in the event of a fire. So um, delayed egress. Check with your local building code. In FPA 80, um, version 2006, section A, A.18.2.2.2.4, uh, um, you're only allowed to have one um, delayed egress uh, device per exit path. So if you have, um, you know, you're usually going to have two or four um, stairwells, depending on the size of your hospital, but you're only allowed to have one um, that is um, able to be controlled um via delayed egress um key fob access control um, something like that so keep that in mind and make sure you check with local jurisdiction prior to uh, specifying your devices so here's a an example of that so as you can see all of these openings are um, monitored from the nurse's station and you can even monitor the delayed you know the, the delayed egress uh, mexa device with um, from the nurse's station as well um, you can either limit that access, you can allow access, depending on who's going through that opening, but keep that in mind. Um, most of the time, if the alarm is activated, you're going to have to have a manual key switch. Someone's going to have to go to that door and unlock it for you, um, and, or it, it might be on the wall, it might be at the nurse's station, um, but it, it will have to be reset, especially in memory care um, or facilities such as that. As soon as you touch that device um, or try to press and get out of that room, um, the alarm's going to sound and it's going to have to be reset somewhere um, in order for it to be operational again. Behavioral healthcare suites. So the thing that's going to be very important here is just the conal device, um, which you see right above me, um, where the rose is shaped like a cone. Um, you're also going to see more of the hospital tips and um, something that's going to be a little bit different. Most of the time, your door closure is going to be installed on the patient room side of a um, door, whereas with a behavioral health um, healthcare room, you're not going to want to do that. Um, you know, you're not going to want to put a closure on the inside of a door because that's going to create a, a spot where someone can kind of hang um, either rope, bed cloth, um, something like that on those doors. So most of the time, those rooms are going to have either a concealed um, closer or they're going to have a closer on the opposite side. Most of the time it's going to be concealed. Here's a, an example of those conal um, devices. I showed you some examples of them earlier. I'm not going to um, stick around with it because I know that I'm holding you guys way longer due to my technical difficulties, so I apologize. Um, so I'm running through these slides. But um, basically, you're just trying to um, make a device or put a device on a room to where everyone can be safe, safe on the outside of the room, and also the patients can be safe on the inside of the room. And when, when I say safe, safe from themselves. So when specifying these, however, you got to make sure that they're ADA compliant. Um, the dimpled knob is not ADA compliant. Why is it not ADA compliant? It's because of the way that um, you have to grip that knob in order for you to um, turn it. You, whenever it's to meet ADA, it has to be able to be one motion, and it, you don't have to use any sort of um, gripping or force uh, to, to to turn that knob. You can, you should be able to turn it with your elbow, with your hand, um, with without having to use pinching to do it.
So track arm closers, this is gonna be mounted um, on the push or pull side of the door and the track is mounted on the frame. As it says here, this is the most acceptable mounting in many behavioral um, health settings. Closers should be mounted on the supervised, supervised side of the door. So opposite the patient side, um, it's gonna be on the outside of the um, room. Um, so this is, like it says, it is an acceptable um, solution for uh, behavioral health. Um, you could also use concealed. So in those um, behavioral rooms, you're gonna have a lot of specialized hardware. Um, you wanna be able to monitor when, when that door is open, when, it, when that door is closed. You're gonna be able to, you're gonna wanna be able to monitor if that latch is in the depressed position or not. And so by doing that, you got a lot of um, ads to that hardware that you um, have to account for. As you can see, you have on the hinge side, the power transfer, which we saw earlier when I was showing you, uh, mistakenly showing you um, an electric strike with an electrified hinge, which does not work, by the way, it does not work. Um, but if you have an electrified lock set, you're gonna wanna use a power transfer device, whether it be a power transfer device that looks like this or a separate piece of hardware that's a power transfer device. Um, both of them are acceptable. If you want to use less hardware, more concealed hardware and things like that, I would suggest going with a butt hinge that has a power transfer device or a continuous hinge that has a power transfer device rather than going with, um, you know, a continuous hinge and then putting a power transfer device on it as well. It's just another piece of hardware. but depending on what you're wanting to specify, what you're wanting to um, use as your function. Some people like having that separate device because you can operate on it and things like that separately. But most manufacturers come with uh, an access point for your power transfer device to where you can access that uh, material without having to uh, take down the door. Um, from the power transfer device, you're also going to want to have a door sensor, which is located at the top of the door. Um, that door sensor will tell um, the system, whether the door is in the open position or in the closed position. Um, from there, you're also going to want to have either an electrified lock set to allow operation, or um, you're also going to have that electrified lock set that will allow latch bolt monitoring. Latch bolt monitoring allows a person to know if that latch bolt is in a retracted or retracted uh, or detracted um, retracted position, um, whether it's open or closed. Um, you can either use an electrified strike, um, and from there, you're going to want to see, um, you know, you're going to want to use hardware that um, tells you if one of those aren't happening, um, it's going to send an alarm. You're going to see that sensor right above. That sensor is going to go off saying, hey, uh, this door has been open for 15 seconds. You told me that it was only supposed to be open for five. Um, I'm going to send an alarm once that alarm is going off you then run into um, the reset switch, either digitally reset or uh, manually reset, most of the time manually reset with a uh, key switch. Behavioral seclusion rooms. So seclusion rooms are basically rooms that um, allow a person to um, go into a, a room um, once they're inside of there, there is no hardware on the inside where they are. Um, they are secluded from themselves and um, you have to have on the door a peephole, whether it be open and closed, closable peephole, or whether it's open all the time to allow um, you to monitor that person. And basically, if a person is at extreme risk or harm to, their, to themselves, or if um, they just need a little bit of a timeout, you're, you're able to put them into that, that room um, and monitor those, those patients, um, you know, and know that they won't be able to harm themselves. So here's different types of seclusion um, rooms and the hardware that would go on them. You either have single point or three point. Three point is the most secure. It locks at three positions at the top, the middle, and the bottom. Single point would lock just in the um, center, but all applications have zero hardware at the inside.
That being said, do you guys have any questions for me? And again, I apologize for the uh, technical difficulty. What had happened earlier is I have um, everything plugged into a small HDMI port, and whenever I grabbed one of the continuous hinges, I unplugged that, and from there, it was a total mess. So I apologize. But do you guys have any questions for me? If no questions, um, I'll go again with the reminder that, um, you know, this is the end of the um, continuing education credit end of the AIA course. Um, and if you have, um, you know, if you want that certificate, if you want that credential, send me your information so that way we can get that over to you. With that being said, I appreciate you guys for um, for coming in. I'll give, go ahead and give a um, quick shout out to Dorma Kaba. Um, trying to move out of their way. Anyway, um, to Dorma Kaba for allowing me to present this A course. And um, sorry again for the technical difficulty. Um, I want you guys to keep in mind that we do train Tuesdays every week. Most of the time, we don't usually have um, me losing video or me losing the, the, um, the PowerPoint, but we have some cool classes coming up. Next week is probably going to be the coolest that we've presented so far in um, the Training Tuesdays. It's going to be a um, touchless class with Ed Harris in the um, Connection Studio from BEST. And what he's going to discuss is he's going to take you on a brief tour of four different solutions um, that are touchless, and he's going to show you different ways in your facility to, um, you know, to, you know, create a touchless solution. So he'll show you different types of um, actuators. He'll show you touchless actuators. He'll show you automatic door operators, electric strikes, and also um, and also uh, turnstiles. So it's a very cool class. Um, please sign up for that class. And, um, and then after that, we're going to be going over um, Krieger. Uh, Krieger is a specialty door solution, and those guys uh, provide something that's really unique and cool as far as sound doors, RF rated doors that go into skiffs and things like that. And um, and I would love to talk with you guys about those those openings. Um, after that, uh, next month, we're going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be doing a, a whole new lineup of classes. If you have any suggestions for me on what you would like to learn or see, um, please let me know. And I'll be happy to put that presentation on, even if it's something like basic hardware, um, how to hang a door, um, something more extensive. Um, just let me know and we can go over it. Sorry for being frazzled earlier, but with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and um, say thank you. And I appreciate your time. Um, it means so much to me. So I apologize for the difficulties again.